Well, uh, good morning. St I think it's still morning. And I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to be here and to participate in the conference and uh, to say thanks for all the details of the conference, which are very long to organize and no one actually sees it, but uh, that's why we're here and everything is functioning. So uh, I know it's a danger to be the last one in this session before the lunch, so I will try to be as uh, concise as possible. So uh, in fact, uh, years ago, uh, working on the uh, book about Carly Sulman, uh, the outstanding politician and a very controversial figure of Latvian history in the 20th century, I came upon the text by Aspasia, which actually, um, well, it was quite a surprise for me knowing from the school and the universities that uh, Aspasia was also very deep in the social democratic ideas and culture, and she also was uh, one of the feminine authors and politicians who actually pleaded for human rights and justice and social politics. And all of a sudden, uh, I actually discovered uh, her text, uh, a very short poem, uh, which is called uh, the hymn to the leader of the state, hymn Navadonim, uh, which was a part uh, of or her contribution to the uh, second uh, festival or the feast of uh, harvest in Rezekne in Latgale part of uh, Latvia in 1936. So she was one among other male authors who also created like Pludonis, uh, different short poems uh, glorifying the uh, then non-democratic leader of the state Karle Sulmanis. Uh, actually, today I checked uh, on my way to the central station in Riga near his uh, monument in the very center of the city, near the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, and the information about this monument, uh, which is dedicated to this tragic figure, in fact, uh, still avoids mentioning that he was an authoritarian leader meaning dictator, uh, in uh, the period from 1934 to 1940, uh, when Latvia was occupied by the uh, Soviets and the Soviet army entered the state. Uh, and um, it's interesting that uh, near this monument, the, the text um, actually informs the tourists or the locals about him being the first uh, uh, prime minister and uh, also the president, but avoiding this fact of dictatorship. Although, of course, the Baltic dictatorships in this period were defined by Hannah Arendt in her book on totalitarian culture as, uh, as she said, old-fashioned, meaning that the regimes avoided mass repressions. Uh, still, these were uh, non-democratic political cultures, but this is what we skip uh, in the contemporary version of Latvian history of the 20th century. So these are the two heroes of my very short report. So the Aspasia um, and her figure from the uh, Latvian National Theatre um, and the Ulmanis to whom she dedicated this short poetry, which uh, surprised me a lot. So, uh, no, oh, sorry. Uh, Right, I, th I think I can manage now, thanks. And this is um, a very kitsch style picture presented by the contemporary Latvian uh, artist uh, Arturs Berzinc, whose uh, new exhibition is now available in Riga in the Gallery Museum LV. And uh, he uh, painted here the president and the dictator Ulmanis, uh, so to say, uh, somehow in, in kind of a jail which is transparent. Uh, in a very Baroque style uh, form uh, filled with some water or liquid and the guards here and uh, all the other Baroque elements uh, as a deep red color and uh, so actually this is uh, one of the controversial images of uh, Ulmanis at the moment because I think one of the uh, topics for the contemporary Latvian society is how we uh, look uh, at this history of the 20th century. Are we not too selective? Are we not applying some kind of Photoshop to the history of our society where heroes were uh, close to the uh, evil persons, uh, wrongdoers and perpetrators? There have been people who saved Jews and there have been people who participated in murdering people. So this, all of these facts and figures and personalities are part of Latvian society. And of course, this also is related to the issues of post-colonial uh, Latvian society. Are we not still 
uh, kind of inheriting the colonial style of uh, selecting history and avoiding some other parts. So this is the question for the Latvian society uh, as a whole. So uh, of course this image was uh, more traditional in the brochure which was dedicated to this harvest festival uh, and um, in fact, uh, we should place Ulmanis, to whom this poetry was addressed, in the European uh, global context of dictatorships and their poetics and the visual culture of representation. And I think one of the keys to interpret this uh, culture was the, uh, so say, the return of the Baroque culture of uh, glorifying the leader of the king of the emperor, uh, which these leaders inherited from the 17th and 18th century culture. So uh, here we also see that an element of miracle, one of the elements of Baroque culture, was also present in the narrative on the um, role of the uh, uh, leader of the state uh, and he is the one who produces these miracles and it says that the leader has uh, freed us uh, from hate uh, and also uh, the mistrust so now we are uh, as a so it's a group which has no social distinctions. We are as uh, one, we are unified, we are stable and all the rest because sometimes, uh, of course, mistrust is also a part of diversity and culture of debates. Um, it's all gone. And of course, it's gone uh, very quickly, actually, uh, let's say overnight. Uh, and this is uh, one of the examples of how this narrative of uh, miracles uh, was uh, shaped in, uh, uh, so to say, uh, in public events. And of course, glorification of the leaders was a public uh, issue. It was presented to the society as a whole, which now knows no uh, so say social, political uh, or other distinctions or quarrels, because quarrel is a danger. Um, the uh, diversity of political issues is a danger and in fact the parliament itself was a danger which was presented in this new um, so say culture of uh, saved Latvia and this is so called the song of revival the first one in the very series of uh, different festivals and public events in different uh, parts of Latvia and also addressed to different social groups of Latvia and also age groups for example the youth was one of the central points of interest uh, and uh, was the uh, group which was addressed by the new leader personally and also using different uh, festivals. And you also see here, of course, the uh, predominant uh, ethnicity and the folklore elements of Latvian culture. This is uh, a copy of the, um, of the newspaper of this period and we see here uh, the stage and the setting and of course we see here also the uh, traditional villages and the industrial Riga and of course the Riga of the medieval which was German. Uh, and this discourse on Germans as a suspicious minority was also part of the uh, Ulmanis, uh, so to say, uh, ideas of uh, ethnic diversity and, of course, the dominance of uh, ethnic Latvians. Uh, and, of course, uh, he and the culture of uh, non-democratic leaders of the 30s uh, is also uh, to be defined as the Baroque chiaroscuro. So it's a kind of uh, conflict between light and darkness. There is no shadow in between. There are no different stages. It is the final conflict, the final combat, so to say, between good and evil. And, of course, the uh, new leader uh, represents the uh, old mythological hero who will uh, rescue us. Uh, we see here uh, different styles of uh, triumph arcs, the ceremonial culture of addressing the leader, greeting him, and of course uh, presenting different uh, uh, symbolic presents. Um, I know it could be irritating uh, for some of us uh, to compare different leaders of this period uh, what they have in common is the non-democratic culture. What they have as uh, the differences is the level of violence, physical, discursive, in media, and the way how they represent themselves. So here is an example of Mussolini. So it's a human sculpture kind of, and uh, the youth organization of the fascist Italy um, here is uh, creating this M letter because the leader is about to arrive. 
And we see here different ages, of course, the very small, like, I don't know, um, 10 or 12 years, and then finishing with uh, young guys about 20 years old. And um, in some of the newspapers in Italy, there have been rumors, which of course were truth, because this was the uh, media of Mussolini, that the uh, Duce himself stopped one of the earthquakes in Sicily because he visited a small village and with the gaze of his uh, eyes, he could stop the nature. And uh, very quickly, the Catholic Church also included the prayers for his health uh, in the Catholic service. So he was also the one who was creating or producing the miracles. Uh, once again, not to compare the evil, the stage of the evil, or the volume, uh, I think it is important to uh, say that this was the tradition of representing the new leader of the state, which was global. I mean, starting from the uh, Stalinist Russia and going to south to the Mussolini uh, Italy. So the leader was presented as a kind of metaphysical being, a superhero also in his size, forms and supernatural powers. We see here that this is uh, like a giant and uh, of course also dying for Mussolini, meaning that uh, the last breath of your body uh, is uh, associated with the spirit of Mussolini who will lead you to the probably paradise of the heroes. So uh, we see this as a uh, European tradition and um, here is uh, even the local tradition of uh, Russian Orthodox religious uh, imagery where we see the Stalin who is appearing like a saint or a figure of uh, probably God here and this is one of the pictures for the New Year's festivals uh, after the end of the uh, Second World War, where he was glorified as the one who rescued the Soviet uh, state and the civilization. So here we see again some versions of uh, uh, Ulmanis who is greeted by young girls and uh, the uh, roses are being thrown to the um, here for him to uh, represent the uh, um, emotions of the people. Uh, this is again one of the examples of how he is busy with showing the right way to the youth of Latvia. Uh, and he was also the media man of this period. He was fascinated by the radio. He wrote his speeches himself and of course participated in most of these uh, festivals which were glorifying him. And this is actually the volume of poetry and also drama which was uh, specifically written for this festival. <laughs> Uh, called Holy Land. It's not the Jerusalem, but it's Latvia. Uh, and uh, these peasants are greeting Ulmanis, and they actually also skip some of the elements of the history, because of, uh, after the liberation wars, um, there comes Ulmanis period at once, without the democratic period of parties, uh, debates, uh, constitutional crisis, media freedom, and so on. And this is the example uh, of how this uh, uh, second harvest celebration was staged in, uh, in Rezekne in 1936, uh, of course using the tradition of song festivals. And here is the text of Aspasia uh, and the translation, my translation into English. So we see here that uh, this is the glorifying song to a leader who uh, was born, so to say, to lead people, but he is not a human being in his weakness. He is a supernatural hero because he uh, can uh, actually, um, so to say, tame the storms. Uh, he uh, is also the one uh, who is the creator of the new universe because he is a hero and uh, on his uh, shoulders there are, so to say, centuries of culture and history and probably the nature uh, itself. Uh, and uh, so he is also restless, but he can bring peace and rest to the community. So this is again this final uh, fight, the final combat, which was also described by uh, Walter Benjamin in his book on the origins of the German Baroque drama, where he says that the Baroque leader of the king, uh, the one who produces miracles, exists between the social catastrophe and the restoration, which was of course the reality of the European society after the 30 years religious war and also the uh, restoration of political power in England after the Cromwell period. So uh, this is the version of Aspasi and I think this was uh, one of the attempts to actually see behind this text 
uh, the uh, global European tradition of uh, glorification of these uh, leaders who actually made use a lot of this uh, 17th century period. Unfortunately, we see now that across the world uh, we still have uh, a need for leaders who are presented as the one who can fight the darkness and produce light, but uh, of course sometimes it's just uh, a fake light. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. Thank you all for the beautiful presentations. I have a question to Dennis Hanos. And the question is short and straight. Uh, why did it took two years to Aspasia to write that book, uh, uh, that, um, I don't know, that Teju always to Ullman is glorifying him? I think that in the answer lies also, uh, lies also that uh, reason for being surprised because in the cause there are maybe some not ideological contexts. Well, it's, it is uh, very uh, interesting and very difficult question, which actually requires more research on this. Uh, because uh, actually, before I applied for this conference, I asked myself, how can I squeeze my issue of the 17th century opera into this uh, conference? Because actually, um, I'm not the one who uh, goes deeper into the analysis of Aspasia's poetry, but what I know is that, in fact, her uh, uh, the catalog of her symbolic language and the metaphoric uh, figures she was actually developing throughout her uh, literary career actually is uh, here finds its let's say non-democratic version. But if we see the the list of these metaphoric issues, it's still herself. So she is true to herself uh, in her poetry of uh, symbols of nature and the uh, clash of different elements and what we call the heel. Uh, but uh, here I think she is uh, applying her, so to say, democratic uh, literary period to this figure. There have been rumors that she was very fascinated by him as a leader and also as a human person, a human being, but these are rumors uh, which uh, we actually cannot prove. But uh, I think, uh, in fact, I can recognize her still in this poetry uh, before the 19th uh, 34. Uh, as we often say, uh, Rhinus died strategically in 1929, so he didn't have to deal with the Olmanus period. But there is a, just for your information, there is a very interesting interview with Aspasia about this same time, 1936, 1937, uh, with the uh, newspaper Perkonkos, which is the extreme right organization. And her reasoning there uh, for why she likes the whole Ullmanist movement, she hearkens back to the feeling of exaltation that they had uh, during the new current times in the late 1890s, leading up to the 1905 revolution. Uh, Aspasia's argumentation in that interview in Batman Krusts is all about the fact that she is looking for ideals again. She, she wants to feel energized again. She wants to get out of this gray, pragmatic Latvia. She wants to feel this uplift again. So it's a very emotional thing for her. I don't know whether it's really linked so much with the personality uh, of Ulmanis. Uh, uh, but it's definitely that she wants the energy, the uplift, the excitement, the ideals of the pre-1905 generation. These things are very, very much linked for her. So I can just indicate, if, you, if you're going to pursue this uh, theme, there is this very, very interesting interview with her um, um, in this newspaper back home. Thank you very much. No, I'm, I'm showing my complete ignorance in this sense. Uh, I wonder, well, uh, how much was Aspasia familiar with the cultural and literary scene in the UK in the 1930s? As uh, when I was looking at this poem or the translation of it, then, uh, of course, I'm afraid I couldn't kind of place it in the development of Aspasia's own poetics. But what it reminded me of 
was exactly the text written in the 1930s by the Auden generation. Well, uh, W.H. Auden, Stephen Spender, uh, Louis McNeese, this, um, well, uh, centering on the figure of the leader, quite a few of the poets actually were titled the leader, to the leader. The verticality of it, well, uh, of course, in the visuals that you displayed, also the verticality was very prominent. And this, this angle, the, the 30s angle, or the Riefenstahl angle, as they also might call it, uh, were also represented in, in the poems of the Brits of the time. Uh, who, uh, of course, when speaking of the leader, were not necessarily referring to any leader in the UK, but rather, well, as you mentioned, well, it was a global, or Europe, at least, uh, all European thing. That the concept of the leader and the fascination that uh, that was now mentioned with the elan, the, the uh, uplift, the being part of a movement uh, after well, ha kind of period of having no social significance. Uh, in the case of again this older Ishaku generation in the UK, it would have been be, having been born too late for World War One and uh, not experiencing that. Uh, so now that living in the decade uh, of the 30s, that of course Auden would call well um, a, uh, uh, not very nicely uh, at the end of it, uh, regretting his involvement with this uh, leadership exaltation and uh, uh, maybe also you are quite a pro fascist or actually maybe more pro communist views that they expressed then that I, I would see that this poem could have been placed in that context very well. So I, I wonder, for instance, how much this international uh, European scene is playing into it. Uh, well, a very short comment. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I would agree that uh, when, when you read this uh, small brochure, none of the authors, neither Plugonis, nor Aspasia, nor Spruch, they never mention the uh, hero or the leader by his name. So he, every, everyone knows uh, who is, uh, so say, mentioned, but uh, he represents, so to say, the idea of the leadership, which actually needs no name. And that's why I think this is how uh, the poetry before the 1934 fits into this language of uh, n conflict of nature, of forces, uh, light and darkness, and uh, also the storms. So say, the, uh, the idea that storms actually bring also the internal renewal of the personality. What concerns the fascist ideology, which you mentioned, in fact, the uh, Ulmanis uh, regime, uh, what concerns the visual ideas and also the communication politics was very much influenced exactly by the, uh, by the Italian Mussolini culture, not so much by Hitler period. And we know from the archive that he asked, uh, so to say, the representatives of Latvia abroad in Rome to deliver to him, so to say, the information, examples, and the strategies of communication from uh, Mussolini periods of the Mussolini culture. It was more like this rural uh, Italy and the leader, uh, not so much the futurist and the industrial one. Thank you very much. Any more questions? I'd like to thank all the speakers for these wonderful presentations and I'm sure I will come back maybe during the break to the uh, topic of the bog because uh, mire and, and wetland because it, it's uh, so fascinating. I, I have been also investigating it in, in my work. So that's, that's really wonderful to, to hear more about the Estonian uh, side. Uh, and I have a question uh, to Benedict uh, Kalmers, uh, if I may, if um, there are um, some, um, or if anybody has been looking more thoroughly into uh, Latvian women writers' responses to Nietzsche. And the uh, second question, uh, if the um, Nietzsche-Tolstoy debate uh, was somehow more extensive because I know that, for example, in Finland it was just uh, the opposition of the two thinkers that was currently uh, debated in, in those days and, and uh, uh, this, what you were talking about, sounded like a very interesting uh, attempt uh, for synthesis or, or 
Uh, so, yeah, these two questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for, for asking this. Uh, I am afraid my, my short answers will be rather on a, a negative side. Um, as for uh, women writers, uh, I think what also uh, Nietzsche promoted, it was a very masculine culture, actually. It was a very masculine culture, and of course Aspasia was involved because Rainis <laughs> pushed her to write her thoughts every day on things that were going on around as well. I'm not quite aware, maybe my colleagues may be said and us more, uh, I'm not quite aware of women uh, showing that deep interest in, in Nietzsche. And I also think that early 20th century interest in Nietzsche, it was also kind of rather short period. And, and after that, maybe some other names came to the prominence. So, uh, this is difficult to, to figure out. As for Tolstoy and mm, uh, Nietzsche, I think Orus picked up this topic, um, well, it was on one hand a very, uh, very new topic, but as you say, it was very much kind of a European discourse, right? So being in Germany, I think he heard something of that might be important, so he wrote about it. Mm, I don't think, I have to think more, but I don't think at the moment that there was um, really a juxtaposition between the two, but certainly there was a larger pattern of, of kind of a conflict between those who were more Western-oriented and those who looked to the uh, Russian intellectuals uh, at the time. Because in Home Guests Monthly, as a newspaper, first modern European newspaper. If you list pages, you actually see um, of the informational part, it's up to 50 more percent dealing with what is going on in, in, in Russia and of course also Tolstoy, who was a controversial figure with his play, as you know, uh, also, also vanished. So this discourse, East and West is constantly present, but I don't think that it kind of um, really runs into this um, dialogue between Tolstoy and Nietzsche. But I have to think more, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for discussion. Lunchtime is approaching, so let's say thank you for all three of you.